In chapter six, we're going to look at um, an in-depth look at vectors and some of the uses of vectors. So in section 6.1, we're going to talk about inner product, length, and orthogonality of vectors. So we haven't dealt with this much. So I want to think about what a vector actually is. And in essence, what a vector is in two dimensions. So probably most of you, if you haven't caught on so far, understand the idea of what um, that vectors have length and direction. So we can take and create vectors. Now, what I've done here is I've uh, graphed these in a program called Desmos. I've graphed two vectors. Now, I've set my first one at 2, 4, and my second vector at 6, 3. And basically what they are is the line segment, you can think, from the origin to the point 6, 3, or the line segment from the origin to the point 2, 4. Okay? And no matter uh, where we put this, vectors are always going to have some sort of an x value length, some sort of a y value length. Now this is in two dimensions. In three dimensions, we'll, we would go out to, um, we'd have an x, a y, and a z. So vectors are in some ways equivalent to the idea of Hmm. You get that stick at four. It's all right. There you go. Um, of the points where they end at. All right. So we're going to look at a couple of different ideas of vectors, and I may refer back to this slide to see what's uh, what's happening. All right. So let's start with inner product. Now, we all know that we can't multiply two vectors together um, under normal matrix multiplication operations. However, there are a couple of different ways in which we can define a multiplication of two vectors. Now, one of those is called the inner product. Okay, now, in order to calculate an inner product, the vectors have to be of the same dimension. So like in our case in front of us, we have three-dimensional vectors. They come from R3. And the inner product of two vectors is always going to be written as vector x dot vector y. Okay? So this is the, the standard notation for inner product. There's a dot there. By the way, there's also something called a cross product that we're not going to look at um, in this section. But uh, cross product comes up when you d deal with topics in Calc 3, uh, most, most, uh, most things. Now, notice what the inner product is doing. We're taking the first entry of our vector x and our first entry of our vector y and we're multiplying them together. And then we're taking our second entry of x and our second entry of y, multiplying them together. Our third entry of x, third entry of y, multiplying it together. And then adding them all up. So notice that when you take an inner product of two vectors, my answer is going to be a real number. At least as long as the entries are real numbers. So if I have real numbers that are multiplying and adding together, we're going to get real numbers. So I took two vectors from R3, and I ended up with a real number answer for my inner product. So I want you to push pause on the video and try to calculate inner products in the, of these two examples.
So we have two vectors we're taking inner products of. Again, notice the notation. The notation we use is a dot when we deal with inner product. So go ahead and push pause and do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to take the inner product of 4, 2, negative 3 with 3, 1, 8. So all I do is take 4 times 3, which is 12, plus 2 times 1, which is 2, plus negative 3 times 8, which is negative 24. Whoops. And so the inner product of those two vectors is going to be negative 10. All right. These next two vectors, 5 times 2 is 10. 6 times 1 is 6. 2 times 4 is 8. So the inner product of those two vectors is 24. And that's it. That's the inner product. I want you to now calculate the inner product of these two vectors, making note of the fact that these two vectors, 4, negative 3, 6, I've put on the left-hand side in my first multiplication and the right-hand side in my second multiplication, and 0, 5, 4, I've put on the right-hand side of my first multiplication and the left-hand side of my second one. So push pause on the video and go calculate that. All right, so hopefully you went ahead and did that. In my case, we get 4 times 0 is 0, plus negative 3 times 5 is negative 15, plus 6 times 4, which is 24. So when you add those up, you get a positive 9. And notice what you're going to get in the second one. 0 times 4 is still 0. 5 times negative 3 is still negative 15. 4 times 24, excuse me, 4 times 6 is still 24. So you get the same thing in each one because obviously when you multiply two real numbers, that multiplication is commutative. So what this tells us is that the inner product must also, in fact, be commutative. All right. So that's the observation that we see there. So the inner product as an operator is a commutative operator. So if you can take the inner product of x times y, or x dot y, then you're going to get the same thing as y dot x. Now, there are some other properties of inner product. I'm not going to demonstrate these, but it turns out when you take three vectors, x, y, and z, if I want to add x, y, and then take the inner product of that with z, you could have sort of distributed the inner product multiplication into both the x and the y. And inner product is commutative, so we could have, you know, commutatively done that as well. We, in other words, we could have put the z on the left-hand side or the z on the right-hand side. So inner product distributes over addition. And then the other little fact about inner products is that they work well with constant numbers. So if I take a constant times x, again, that's little c stands for any const, any real number constant here, and then do an inner product with y. Well, you could have done the x inner product y, then multiplied by the constant, or you could have multiplied by the constant times y, and then did the inner product with x. So Constants can kind of distribute in and out of the inner product as we would like. Now, I want you to take a look at the inner product of a vector 
with itself. Okay, so let's take the inner product of negative 1, negative 3, 2 with itself, and the inner product of 6, negative 2, 0 with itself. Go ahead and push pause on the video and calculate this, these inner products. All right, so here we go. Um, negative 1, negative 3, 2, and 6, negative 2, 0, each multiplied by themselves uh, in terms of inner product multiplication. So negative 1 times negative 1 is a positive 1. Negative 3 times negative 3 is a positive 9. 2 times 2 is a positive 4. So when you add up all those things, you get a 14. When I take a 6 times 6 gives you 36. Negative 2 times negative 2 gives me a positive 4. And then plus 0. So you get a 40. Now, what I want you to observe is that when you take each entry times itself, it's basically that entry squared. So notice that all of these things you add up are going to be, um, well, positive or zero. So we say non-negative. So we're never going to get any negatives when we do the inner product with a vector by itself. The, and the only times that we get zero is when it's zero times zero. Okay. And if you think about it, the only way you can get a zero as an inner product is if we have the zero vector. So, in other words, the inner product of a vector in itself is always going to be non-negative because when I take the inner product of a vector times itself, I'm basically squaring each entry of the vectors and then adding them all up. And the only way you can actually get out a zero is if we start with the zero vector. So there we go. Now this is nice because of what we're going to look at next. We're going to look at the length of a vector. And we're going to define the length of a vector to be the square root of the inner product. So again, the inner product is going to be a real number. And we're just going to take the square root of that. We just saw that this is going to be non-negative. So it should be always possible to take a square root of it as long as our vectors x or our x's or vector x has real number entries. All right. And by the way, the notation of length of a vector is going to be it kind of looks like two absolute values um, inside of each other. So it's two vertical bars on the left of the vector, two vertical bars on the right. So inner product is the square, excuse me, length is the square root of the inner product. So let's go ahead and calculate length of these four vectors. Push pause on the video, do the square root of the inner product with the vector times itself, and figure out the length of these four vectors. All right, so here we go. Let's take the length of x. So we're going to take the inner product of x times x. So what that's going to do is going to do 2 times 2, which is 4, plus negative 3 times negative 3, which is 9, plus 4 times 4, which is 16, which gives you um, the square root of, I believe, 29. Okay, so let me double check that. Yep, 29. Um, and that's it. Now, if you wanted to round the square root of 29 or simplify the square root of 29, by all means, go ahead. Um, if you wanted to uh, 
you know, take the square root of 9 and call it 5.385 or, you know, roughly 5.385, then you could. But there's not a huge uh, need to do that. All right. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. So there you go. Now, length of y, let's take the length of y. So we take 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 3 times 3. So that is the square root of 9. This one does simplify kind of nicely. The length of that vector is 3. Um, 3, oh, 4. Length of that vector, which we called v, is we take 9 plus 0 plus 16, which becomes the square root of 25. So this one also has a nice length. It's length 5. And then the length of u So when I take negative one-half times negative one-half, I get a positive one-fourth. Plus, when I take square root of 3 over 2 times the square root of 3 over 2, I get 3 fourths. And 0 times 0 is 0. Now notice what we get here. We get underneath the square root, we get a 1. And so that vector u has length 1. Okay. So that is the how to find length of a vector. Now, I want to uh, just state that this is connected to the visual I had up earlier. The length of a vector is the length from the origin to the line uh, to the point, in this case, it would be to the point 6, 3. So if I'm talking about the length of vector 6, 3, it is the length of that line from the origin all the way up to that point. So you do 6 squared plus 3 squared all under a square root. And by the way, that, may, that should make sense because that's connected to the Pythagorean theorem. Right? This 6, 3, if you think about what it's actually doing, there we go. It's create, we can create this right triangle. Oh, didn't do that very well. From the point 6, 3. And what would this be? This would be height length 3, base length 6. And we all know from the Pythagorean theorem that if you look at this right triangle, the length of the hypotenuse is going to be uh, C. If we call this length C, I'm going to call it D for distance. If we look at the distance, distance squared I'm drawing poorly, but that's okay, is going to be equal to 6 squared plus 3 squared. All right, that's a squared. It's ugly. But you see what's going on there. Okay, and so the distance is the square root. of 6 times 6, plus 3 times 3. Okay. And again, that's the square root. 
of the inner product of that vector. Okay, so this is the same distance formula that you know and you've seen before. I'm going to erase that because it looks awful. But uh, it is the same distance formula that we've dealt with before or that you've probably dealt with before. All right, so we found the length of those four vectors. Now, there are certain times in which it's nice to have unit vectors, OK? So any vector of length 1 is known as a unit vector. So in our previous slide, we saw that the vector u had length 1. So the u from our previous slide would have been called a unit vector, OK? Now, the other three vectors that we dealt with were not unit vectors. So obviously, x had length 5.385, y had length 3, v had length 5, u was the only one that had length 1. So what we can do is we can create we can create unit vectors in the same direction as the vectors that we had before. So let's think about how we could create a unit vector in this same direction. Now, when I say in that same direction, um, let's go back to the 6, 3 example. So when I say I want to create a unit vector, in the same direction. Basically, I want a vector that goes out for a certain length along the path that 6, 3 is taking, and then it stops when it hits length 1. Now, I drew this poorly because when it stops at length 1, who knows? It might be somewhere in here. Something like that. I don't know. Maybe closer to here. But it's not going to go all the way out to where x is 1. The length of the vector needs to be 1. Now, by the way, in this situation, my unit vector is just a scalar multiple of 6, 3. Obviously, If I started, so I'm going to make it just like that. Obviously, if I started my vector, instead of using 6, 3, if I used a really short vector, in order to get a unit vector, I'm going to have to scale it up instead of scale it down. Does that make sense? So, But the point is, it's in the same direction. So if I go to 6, 3, roughly 6, 3, unit vector is I'm going to scale that vector down to where this what I would my red vector has length one all right so that's what's happening in the sense so when I say scale it down or in the same direction in the same direction means it's along the same path in other words it's going to be a scalar multiple um, these two are going to be scalar multiples of each other So let's create one in the direction of 3, 0, 4. So we've taken our v, which we know has length 5. Let me get to a new page there. So we've taken our vector, which we know has length 5. Now, if we want to make sure this has length 1, all we have to do is multiply v by some scalar. Now, what scalar do we need to multiply it by? Well, we need to multiply it by 1 fifth. Think of what that's going to do. So let's take 1 fifth times v. 
Okay. So what we get as a vector is 3 fifths, 0, 4 fifths. Now, if I think about the length of that vector, the length of 1 fifth times v, do it down here. There's some things that are bold that don't need to be, but that's all right. So length of one fifth times v is going to be equal to the square root. If I take three fifths and square it, oh, that's ugly. That's better. And then plus 0 squared plus 4 fifths squared. What you'll notice is that we end up with the square root. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is going to be 25, so we're going to get 9 over 25 plus 0 plus 16 over 25, which 9 plus 16 is just 25. So I end up with 25 over 25, which is obviously 1, and when I take the square root of that, I still get a 1. Okay? That's better. Okay. So there you go. So basically, all I do when I take the, when I want to find a unit vector, is I take the length, take the reciprocal of the length, and multiply it times the vector itself. That will be a unit vector in the same direction as v. So what I'd like you to do is try another one. I want you to go ahead, create the unit vector in the same direction as the x. This is the same x we dealt with a couple of slides ago. And then once you've created that unit vector, see that it indeed works out. In other words, see that when you plug in, or when you calculate the length of whatever unit vector we found, that it comes out as length 1. All right, so hopefully you went ahead and did that. Now, from the previous work, we saw that the length of x is square root of 29. So all we would have to do to create a unit vector is should be to take 1 over the square root of 29 and then multiply that times x. Now, if you do that, basically all these entries are just going to be divided by the square root of 29. So we're going to get entries which are 2 divided by square root of 29, negative 3 divided by square root of 29, and 4 divided by square root of 29. All right, so that is the unit vector that is in the same length, as we is in length 1, hopefully. It'll have length 1, and it, would, and it will be in the same direction as x. Now, you can confirm that this has length 1 by just taking the length so inner product, 2 over root 29 times another 2 over root 29 is going to give me a 2 times 2 is 4. Square root of 29 times square root of 29 is just 29. So you're going to get 4 over 29 when you take your first entries, multiply them together. Negative 3 
over root 29 times another negative 3 over root 29 is going to give me 3 times 3 is 9 divided by 29. 4 times 4 is 16 divided by 29. So what you'll see is you get 4 over 29, 9 over 29, 16 over 29. 4 plus 9 plus 16 is 29 over 29. And obviously, that reduces to just 1. So what I'm saying is that if you ever wanted to have a, to sort of scale down your vector and make it instead of length 5.385, blah, 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 then all I have to do is multiply it times the appropriate coefficient. All right, so for any non-zero vector, I can do that. Now, another concept that we look at in section 6.1 is the concept of distance between two vectors. So the distance between two vectors is basically the length of the vector we would create when we subtract the two vectors. Now we can take a look at what this is actually um, doing here. So let's go back to my drawing where I had the vectors 2, 4, and 6, 3. Now what would the distance between the, those two vectors be? Well, simply put, the distance between 2, 4, and 6, 3 is the distance of, if I had drawn a straight, the straight line between these two. In fact, you can see that if you subtract, you would get those, depending on the way you subtract. So the distance between those is the distance between the point that they end at, the point, the point that this one ends at, and the point that this one ends at. All right, so that's the distance of that line is, in fact, the distance between the two vectors. Okay? So, let's go ahead and calculate All that. Why is not? I want you to find the distance between five two and one three, and then think about what that looks like graphically. Push pause on the video and go ahead and do that. All right, so hopefully you went ahead and did that. So here's what we did. We got 5, 2, and 1, 3. We're looking at the distance between those two vectors. So we take and subtract. Uh, 5 minus 1 is 4. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. By the way, you'll notice that the distance from uv to vu is exactly the same, because if I would have subtracted v minus u, all it would do is change that positive 4 to a negative 4, and that positive 1, I mean that negative 1 to a positive 1. But when we take the length, since we're squaring each entry, taking each entry times itself, that really doesn't change anything. So u minus v, I'll do it that way. That turns into a positive 4 and a minus 1. Now, length of 4, negative 1 is going to be the square root of the inner product of 4, negative 1 times itself. 4 times 4 is 16. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. So what we end up with is that the length or the distance between u and v is the square root of 17. Alright, 
So that's how it goes. Now, what's this look like graphically? We kind of already went over what it looks like graphically, but basically it's the length of that section again from tip to tip. Um, I'm not going to draw that, but tip of the vector to tip of the vector. So there we go. I want you to calculate the distance between these two vectors. So push pause on the video, calculate the distance between these two vectors and R3, and then um, I will do it as well. All right, so here it is. So we take U and V, and we're going to subtract them. Now be careful when you subtract, because we have negatives around here. So I do 4 minus negative 2. Subtracting a negative is like adding 2. So I end up with a 6. Negative 1 minus 5, I end up with a negative 6. And 3 minus 7, we end up with a negative 4. By the way, if you just subtracted V minus U, you would have ended up with just changing the signs on each of these entries. So what we do, find the length. Take 6 times itself, which is 6 times 6 is 36. Negative 6 times a negative 36 is a 36. Negative 4 times negative 4 is a 16. We take the square root of all of that, and we see that the distance between this u and this v is the square root of 88. Now, the square root of 88 is an irrational number. So if you wanted to simplify that and write something like uh, 2 root 22, that's fine. But square root of 88 is perfectly acceptable. Um, to have a length. If you wanted to round it, um, if you rounded it to two decimal places, 9.38 would be rounded to two decimal places. All right, so that's the idea of distance. Now we get into what's going to be the major focus of Chapter 6. And that is the concept of orthogonal vectors. So we say that two vectors are orthogonal if the inner product is 0. So if the inner product is 0, then those two vectors are orthogonal. Now, what this would mean in R2, well, let's take a couple of, let's take a look at R2. So orthogonal, orthogonal vectors in R2 are ones that hit at a 90 degree angle. So if I've drawn this right, if they hit at about a 90 degree angle in R2, then they are orthogonal. If they don't hit at a 90 degree angle, then they're not orthogonal. So for instance, these two vectors are not orthogonal. However, this one and this one something like that, appear to be orthogonal because they appear to hit at 90 degree angles. So there you go. Now in general, there's the, oh, how do I say? In general, there's something about this that you can extend to R3 and R4 and R5. And it has to do with the, the length. But basically, what we need to understand is that orthogonal vectors are 
somehow akin to perpendicular vectors in R2. Okay? And we can see when they're orthogonal because when they are orthogonal, the inner product is zero. So I want you to go ahead and see if these two vectors are orthogonal. All right, so hopefully you did that. All right, so we take these two vectors and we do the inner product. I'm calling them u and v just to make it a little bit shorter. You know, you can call them whatever you want. 2 times 12 is equal to 24. Minus 3 times 8 also, well, that's actually equal to negative 24. So when you add them up, you get a zero. So these two vectors are in fact orthogonal. And if you graphed those two vectors, let's try to graph those. This is going to look a little bit ugly, but that's okay. Um, we say two and then negative three. And we'll go to 12, 8. And so what we see is that, let me scroll back a little bit, 12, 8, and 2, 3 are in fact orthogonal, so they are perpendicular. At least they look perpendicular. Okay. All right. Now, again, that concept of orthogonality extends to other dimensions and so on and so forth. I want you to test if these two vectors are orthogonal. 9, 2, and negative 1, 4. All right, so 9, 2, negative 1, 4. When I multiply 9 times negative 1, I get negative 9. 2 times 4, I get 8. You end up with a negative 1. So obviously, these two vectors are not orthogonal. By the way, if we looked at, I'll try to do this. Um, the two vectors that we had, 9, 2. 9, 2, somewhere there, negative 1, I don't know if, oh, yep, my, my things won't allow me to get them back there, dang it, negative 1, 4 would be up here where my cursor is, I can't get the dot to move past the y-axis, but you can see that these kind of look close to orthogonal, but they are not orthogonal, obviously. So, there we go. So these are not orthogonal, while the previous example was orthogonal. I want you to test these two vectors and see if these two vectors are orthogonal. All right, so hopefully you did that. If you didn't, push pause. So 2 times 4 gives me 8. Negative 3 times 5 gives me negative 15. 1 times 7 gives me 7. So 2 times 4 gives me 8. Minus so 8 minus 15 plus 7 is the inner product of those two vectors. And obviously that gives me out a 0. And therefore these two vectors are in fact orthogonal. Now, one thing, one um, thing we get out of orthogonality is a Pythagorean theorem. Two vectors, u and v, are orthogonal if and only if 
they satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. Now, if you actually go ahead and do this, this is u plus v orthogonal um, dot inner product with another u plus v. And what you'll see is if you expand this out, you get u squared plus u dot v plus v dot u plus v squared. Well, that's the same thing as these things if and only if the inner product is zero. So again, Pythagorean, this is the Pythagorean theorem. In two dimensions, what this would look like is the following. If we were to add two vectors, now by the way, adding two vectors is not quite exactly what you think it is. So when we add two vectors, what I would do, let's say I wanted to add the purple vector to the red vector, what I would do is I would take this purple vector and try to basically tack it on to the red vector over here. Okay. And when I add two vectors, I've created a third vector. I should have probably done that in a different... Uh, um, color. So let me erase that. So when you add two vectors, purple vector gets added here. That creates a new vector that I've drawn in black. So this black vector is the sum. And you can see that this is going to form a right triangle when the purple and red were orthogonal to begin with. Okay? So we ended up with the length of the black vector squared is length of the purple squared plus length of the red squared. Okay? Because of that right triangle. So there you go. That's the idea of that Pythagorean theorem using vectors. So this is the vector form of the Pythagorean theorem. We're not going to use that a whole lot because it requires us to, to know when vectors are orthogonal. So that's not something that we deal with a whole lot in this class, but it is something that's nice to have seen once or twice. Now, we have that two vectors are orthogonal or not. We can expand that and say a vector can be orthogonal to a set. Now, a vector is going to be orthogonal to a set if the vector is orthogonal to every vector which is in that set. So, if a vector is orthogonal to every single vector in the set, we say V, I mean, we say Z is orthogonal to that set. So let's take a look at this. I want you to try to calculate Z inner product with each one of these three vectors and determine if z is orthogonal to the set w. Go ahead and push pause and see if that is true. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, there's three vectors in the set w, so I'm going to have to do three inner products. So I'm going to take z, and I'm going to take an inner product with z with this first vector. So when I did that, I got 5 minus 4 minus 1, which is 0. So that's good. Z is orthogonal to this first vector here. How about the second vector? Well, 1 times 0 is 0, minus 
2 times 1 is minus 2, plus 1 times 2 is 2, so I get a 0. So good, z is orthogonal to the second vector. Now let's take the inner product of z with the third vector. We end up with 5 minus 6 plus 1, which is also 0. So z is orthogonal excuse me is orthogonal to every vector in the set W and therefore we say z is orthogonal to set W. Okay, hopefully uh, that all makes sense. So if z is orthogonal to every vector in the set, we say z is orthogonal to the set itself. I want you to try to calculate this. See if z is orthogonal to w given this z and this w. Go ahead and push pause and try to figure that out. All right, so hopefully you did that. I'm going to go through it. So take 0, negative 2, 2 times each vector in W. If I multiply 0, negative 2, 2 times 7, 1, 1, which is the first vector in W, I get 0 minus 2 plus 2, which is 0. Good. So Z is orthogonal to the first vector. When I take Z and do the inner product with the second vector, I get 0 minus 6 plus 6, which is 0. That's good. That means z is orthogonal to the second vector. And when I do the third vector, I get 0 minus 8 plus 2, which is a negative 6. z is not orthogonal to that third vector. Now, because z is not orthogonal to that third vector, that means z is not orthogonal to the set w. All right. So if we were going to write this, we would say z oops, is, I don't need to do italics, is not orthogonal to w. So the vector z is not orthogonal to w, to the set w. Okay, so it can be orthogonal to every single vector except for one. And if that's true, then it's still not orthogonal to the set. All right. Now this leads to the idea of what's called a, an orthogonal complement. So we say that the set of all vectors orthogonal to every vector in the set W is the orthogonal complement of W. Usually this is denoted with a W and then in for an exponent we put the perpendicular symbol. So orthogonal complement of W sometimes is, well, almost as always written W with an exponent, which looks like a perpendicular symbol, okay, which is, again, the upside down T. So in short, we have a vector Z is in the orthogonal complement if z, when I take it times the inner product of any vector from w, gives me out a 0.
So we just need to, want, if we're going to check if z is in the orthogonal complement, that is checking what we just did. So for instance, in my, when I looked at orthogonal to a set two slides ago, we saw that this z was orthogonal to every vector in w. So we would have said z is in the orthogonal complement of w. This z, because when we took the inner product of this z with the last vector in the set, we didn't get 0. So this z is not in the orthogonal complement of w. Now it turns out that the orthogonal complement of a set is in fact a subspace. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to prove that the orthogonal complement of any set is a subspace. Now hopefully you remember the three properties of being a subspace. So to be a subspace, we have to have the zero vector. We have to have closed under addition. And we have to have closed under scalar multiplication. So we're going to let two vectors, which we call x and y, be in the orthogonal complement. And we're going to let c be some real number. So first off, let's focus on 0. OK, is 0 in the orthogonal complement? Well, let's let w, as in lowercase w, be a vector which is in the set w. It can be any vector in the set w. Well, if I take, oops. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. If I take the zero vector and I do an inner product with any w in my set w, well, zero vector inner product with anything is going to give you out the real number zero. So what this means is that, yes, when you take the zero vector, it is going to be orthogonal to everything, every vector in W. OK, so the zero vector, it must be in the orthogonal complement of W. All right, there you go. So zero vector is there. What about closed under addition? So let's take the vector x plus y. Excuse me. And let's dot product that with the vector w. Now, because of the rules of inner product, we're going to get x inner product w. By the way, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Uh, inner product is always symbolized with a dot. So sometimes people call this the dot product as well. So because of the way that the inner product or the dot product distributes over addition, we can distribute and say x dot w plus y dot w. Now remember, x and y individually were already in the orthogonal complement, meaning that x dot anything in w is going to give me the zero vector.
y dot anything in w is also going to give me the zero vector. And so what we see is that when you add two vectors which are in the orthogonal complement, that sum is also going to be in the orthogonal complement. So there we go. So the sum of x plus y is in the orthogonal complement. Therefore, it's closed under addition. Now, as far as scalar multiplication goes, we're going to do a very similar thing. So we're going to do cx dot w, where x and w are vectors. C is just a constant real number. So what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying the C times X. Now we should know that, again, rules of inner products say that we can take a C out and do an X inner product with W. Again, remember X we already know is in the orthogonal complement. So we end up with a C times the zero vector. Now this C is just a real number. I'm sorry, did I say zero vector? I apologize. Um, those should not, those have just been, should have been real number zeros, not zero vectors. I misspoke, okay. Yeah, I said it I said it right, or at least I wrote it right up there. So when you take an inner product, you get out a real number. So up here I should have said real number zero plus real number zero equals real number zero. So x plus y is in the orthogonal complement, so the orthogonal complement is closed under addition. Same thing here x dot w is the real number zero. c times zero is just the real number zero. Okay? So, yes, in fact, we get that if you take a scalar times a vector, which is already in the orthogonal complement, then that product will be in the orthogonal complement. So what we're saying is that the zero vector is in the orthogonal complement. The orthogonal complement is closed under vector addition. The orthogonal complement is closed under scalar multiplication. So therefore, the orthogonal complement is, in fact, a subspace of whatever vector space I'm dealing with. So what I would like you to do is ask yourself, is Z in the orthogonal complement of W? And W is going to be the span of those two vectors. So push pause and go think through if w or excuse me if z is in the orthogonal complement of w now there's going to be a couple of ways we see this um, but let me start out with saying this now z is this vector here -1 0 1 and w is the span of this so we have infinitely many vectors in W, but we can take care of them all at once if we realize that any vector in W can be just written as a coefficient times the vector 2, 1, 2, plus some other coefficient times the vector 1, 1, 2. 
negative 3. So any vector that's in W is going to be written as a linear combination of these two vectors, 2, 1, 2, and 1, 1, negative 3. So all we have to do is take the inner product of z times some arbitrary w. Now, hopefully what we see when we do that, z, inner product, and arbitrary w, is that I'm going to take this vector, inner product, with the linear combination. By the way, the linear combination, I should probably put that, hopefully I can put that in parentheses. There we go. And what's going to happen? Well, using the same um, distributive property that, property that we did before, I can take and set negative 1, 0, 1, inner product with 2, 1, 2. And I can factor out an A1 in front of that. And then the same thing goes. I can take negative 1, 0, 1, distribute it in here, factor out an A2. Make sure we have our inner product or our dot product there. And what we see is, well, when I take this first dot product, we get negative 2, 0, positive 2. So you get a 0. So you get A1 times 0. That's the real number, 0, plus A2. Here we get negative 1, 0, negative 3, so times a negative 4. So what we can see is that there are values for A2 in particular in which I don't get out a 0 when I inner product it. So this can be non-zero. In fact, negative 4a2 is often non-zero. All right, so we can find vectors in W where z is not orthogonal to those vectors in W. All right, so z is not in the orthogonal complement of w. Now, this was kind of a lot of work to write every w as an arbitrary vector. Really, what's this hinge on? This hinges on the fact, is z orthogonal to every element in a basis for w? Or at least, is z orthogonal to every vector in a spanning set for w. In this case, z was orthogonal to one element in my basis, but it was not orthogonal to the other. Therefore, z is not orthogonal to the set w itself. I would like you to check and see if z is in the orthogonal complement of this set w. Go ahead and push pause on the video and do that. All right, so again, knowing that, all we have to do is check to see if z is orthogonal to the spanning set. 
All we really need to do is check if z is orthogonal to 4, 2, 4, and if it's orthogonal to 5, 5, 5. So we take our z, we look at the inner product of 4, 2, 4 with z, you get a negative 4 plus 0 plus positive 4. That gives you 0. So z is orthogonal to 4, 2, 4. And then we check to see if z is orthogonal to 5, 5, 5. In this case, we're going to get negative 5, 0, positive 5. When you add those up, you get a 0. So z is orthogonal to both these two vectors, and therefore z must be orthogonal to the span of those two vectors. So z is orthogonal to every single vector in set w. In other words, z is in the orthogonal complement of w. So when we deal with in sets which are of infinite size, then we're looking for a basis or a spanning set for that set W. And this is the observation we were going off of. If I have a vector Z that is orthogonal to every vector in a basis for a subspace, then it must be also orthogonal to every vector in the subspace itself. All right? So we looked at a lot of things. We're going to deal with a lot of orthogonality in the coming sections. But again, all of this hinges off of inner products, the concepts of vectors, inner products, length, and then orthogonality. We'll do some more work uh, with orthogonality again in the next few sections, so make sure you're on top of knowing what's going on.